Here. Hunt. Here. Khan. Here. Smoka. Here. Hi. Here. Wong. Here. Ader. Here. Thanks for coming tonight. You never know who's going to show up, but uh, it's lovely that everybody's here. Some people recognizable by hair. <laughs> um, the mission of School District 15 is to produce world-class learners by building a connected learning community. We'll start with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are going to start the meeting today with public comments. Um, if anybody is here from the public and would like to speak, you can fill out a form and uh, speak to the board. Did we get anything here? No. Nothing? Would anybody like to speak? Tom? <laughs> All right. Tom, Tom takes a pass. <laughs> Dr. Hines? <laughs> There's a comment there, but I won't make it. <laughs> it may not be funny to everybody else, but it, it remains very funny to me. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's nice to see everyone. Um, wanted to just say congratulations to one of our board members, Sam Ader, who we'll be expecting. Uh, just a small thank you and congratulations from Cabinet there for you to enjoy um, when your new baby arrives. Thank you so much. We You're appreciate absolutely. it. Congratulations. <laughs> We're very excited. <laughs> and thank you to Lisa Ness for shopping for us. <laughs> she loves shopping, thank especially you, Lisa. for little baby clothes. And maybe it inspired you to have a fork? I don't know. No. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> superintendent update. Lots to share. Since our last meeting, we um, had two institute days and two e-learning days, um, two of four that were allowed uh, or provided to school districts by the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, our employees, really those that um, planned the days, did a tremendous amount of work and really delivered, I think, a very high, high level um, of professional development and that just-in-time professional development, which teachers have been, you know, um, really applying to their work with students every single day. So a big thank you to those that planned Institute Day and a thank you to staff for just very deeply engaging in those four days. Um, the first day of school certainly was one like we never would have anticipated. Um, I, I can't unfortunately say it didn't go off without a hitch because we did have some technology hitches and we continue to have some, but um, everybody has been very patient and we've really pooled a lot of resources together to try to help overcome some of the, the tech um, issues that we've had. I will talk a little bit more about those tech issues when I get to the tech portion of my update. But we're underway, we're in week three, um, it's our third Wednesday of school, and I think things are just getting much smoother each and every day, um, even from a tech perspective. We're getting into a group, which is really nice to see um, during these very, um, these very different times in, in school. Um, Tech, teaching and learning, professional development updates that have been going on, e-learning, um, the third of five days is planned for 918. The primary two areas of focus on those days will be introducing Zoom as an additional platform that teachers can use to have meetings with students. Several of the benefits of Zoom, um, one largely has to do with the, the ability for um, teachers to, to put kids into breakout rooms so they can differentiate. We've asked, we've heard from several in the community, members of the community, how will teachers be able to differentiate? This is a great differentiation tool. Um, it's, it's another platform. It's not going to replace, replace Google Meets. It'll be an additional resource that teachers can use. Um, teachers can have whiteboards. They can split students into small breakout rooms. And there's uh, easy ways for teachers to schedule with students online. So we feel as though it's going to be a great addition to the platforms that we've already been offering. Additionally, we have a pilot going on with GoGuardian Teacher. GoGuardian is really like a nice classroom management platform that helps um, teachers minimize distractions, monitor what children are doing while they're online, and we, we see it as a, as a great engagement tool. So 
we have a pilot going on right now and those teachers uh, are giving the instructional tech department lots of great feedback. They really like the tool and we will be rolling out GoGuardian Teacher on the 18th so all teachers know how to use GoGuardian and can begin doing so with their students. But it really is a nice way for teachers to see what students are doing you know, while they're in e-learning. Mm -hmm. So we, we think it's going to be well received um, and, and a great management uh, and engagement tool for staff. Does that actually allow teachers to see the kids' screens or does it give it a report of what they're it's on or what like they're utilizing? It's not like Hapara, to my knowledge. Hapara lets them... It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit like that or like um, Lance School. It allows them to see a screen that they can see what they're doing and what they're doing You too. Doing, they can see that, and if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they can see that, and they can actually click on it, and they could close tabs that, that maybe they're on. They can send them a message cool. saying, you know, this is not the time for YouTube or whatever it might be. Right. Um, and then they can also send them links and have this automatically open within the browser as well. So we think it's going to be a, a wonderful tool yeah. <laughs> for for all the reasons that, that Janice just shared. <laughs> Great. Um, we're continuing to put virtual classroom supports in place. We've had a number of committee meetings and we've, we've come up with ways in which um, our virtual classroom teachers know who to contact. If you're a parent, you know who to contact. If you're a teacher um, and whatnot. So we have really been building that out because they are working from home. They don't, most of them, they don't have a home base of a school. There's a level of, some people are feeling disconnected. So we're really trying to make sure they have contact people that they can get the help they need um, as quickly as possible. Um, and, and the team has done a nice job uh, with that. We've also um, deployed, we have a number of tech um, of technicians that have been assigned to start each day at a school. So uh, one technician is assigned to two schools. So every other day, a member of the tech department is at a school and is available to help provide some tech support because some of our Chromebooks um, you know, do need a little, you know, reboot or some kind of a refresh. And they're, they're at our schools able to help. Um, so the front office and the principals and assistant principals don't necessarily have to be the go-to tech folks. So that has been a significant support. Um, I'm sure you probably saw the article. We also had tech tents that were, uh, you know, throughout the community where family members, some, some grandparents that are helping with e-learning can come to tech tents and have, um, any type of technical assistance that they need. So that's a couple of things that are happening with instructional tech and tech support. We continue to bring in our Yale students for their home language uh, screening and work that has to be done so we know how to place them for service. And they've been coming in with lots of layered uh, safety protocols in to be assessed, that's going very well. We continue to work to plan what junior high literacy is going to look like. We have a material pickup because we're trying to make sure that all of the time that kids are learning is not just on the screen. We've heard loud and clear from parents and some teachers that they'd like a balance of screen time as well as paper pencil materials. So we have been working to put grade level packets together, send additional resources like readers notebooks home, um, number lines, additional math manipulatives that folks might need when they're home learning. And um, each school has set a separate date to pick up those materials. So. Material pickups will start at some of our schools tomorrow on the 10th and continue into next week, but principals have communicated that information directly with parents. Um, gifted and talented planning continues, as does our MTSS committee work. One of the things we're really driving uh, right now is, is solidifying our literacy screening and how so we can provide intervention support. And um, it's it's more difficult and it's different actually maybe not more difficult but assessing kids virtually so we've spent some time trying to figure out what how, how we're going to shift those baseline literacy assessments at the beginning of the year and um, those assessments started I start I believe start tomorrow is that correct Meg? start tomorrow and we'll go um, into next week and then shortly thereafter we'll get our kids into literacy intervention so that's happening You'll hear tonight a lot about the finance and facility work that we've been doing. We're wrapping up construction punch list items. Um, we're working on our boilers. We have five boiler projects, so we're working um, to, to get that operationalized. And our new facility team is working to take a fresh look at the five-year health life safety priority list. And we're going to be probably fine-tuning some of them. We'll bring that information to the board probably, I would foresee, at the October meeting. 
to start engaging with you around what has to happen you know, each year of the next five within that decennial report. Um, let's see, I talked about text, and then I'm going to pass around at some point. I received a couple just nice notes to the board that I want to share, just notes of thanks um, for, for different things that have been happening across the district, so I will pass those up. And then lastly, I want to provide just a COVID update. So since our last board meeting, um, and Morgan, if you're here, if you want to come up, or if you want to just, talk, maybe from here it might be easier for everybody to hear you. We've been working to build a COVID dashboard. So we have um, a, a one-stop shop to report how we're doing staff and, and uh, student-wise in terms of COVID. Morgan's been instrumental in doing this, so I asked her to please uh, oh. take the lead. So Julie's working on getting it um, put up here. Julie, do you need help? It was there for a sec. So I'll talk just the concept before we can get it up. But there are, are several different categories that we're keeping track of so that both internally and to the public, they can have a quick glimpse about the status of COVID in our schools, not just positive cases, but due to the IDPH guidelines, if a person is exhibiting even one symptom of COVID, they have to stay home. And if they have a family member who has a symptom of COVID, they also have to stay home until they satisfy the criteria of having a negative COVID test or alternative diagnosis. So there are many things related to this that impact our staffing and impact our ability to operationalize the day to day. So uh, this is the dashboard. We'll bring you to the live one. I guess when you see it, when you click on that link, it's not liking it too much. Well, we'll just, I'll just talk to what's on the screen and then this will be live on our website by the end of the week so that the public and all of you can take a look at it. But you can see we have different categories here. We have by building uh, the number of new active COVID positive students or new active cases of positive staff members. We also have close contacts in quarantine, which means in this definition, anyone who is exposed within the school or the district. Beyond that, we are keeping track of how many staff members are absent due to illness. So we are finding that information out because um, the self-certification that staff members have to take before coming to work each day, they have to let us know if they have a symptom. So we have a record of that. And then also staff members who are absent because they've either had close contact with someone who has COVID outside of the district or they have a family member who is ill, which means that they also need to stay home. So there's a lot of different things that we need to keep track of. We know that there is a substitute shortage nationally and certainly here as well, especially during COVID. So we need to make sure we have uh, enough subs to staff on any given day if we have many absences. So this will help us just have a quick glimpse of the status in the community. So we, we intend on this to be a public document like I mentioned we have a website that we're building out with some additional information on it just explaining how we're receiving this information so we feel as though this will help everyone stay informed to the current situation any questions about it without having seen it live I guess it's not mm -hmm. so if it's live Morgan are you drilling down into the numbers or are you drilling down into the 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 titling area on the side so if you could see it it it, it totals at the bottom so the document will be embedded into the website so we can make changes through google um, and then it will automatically update on the web so you can if it were live you could scroll to the bottom and see a daily tally of of absences due to whatever category so um that is at the top we'll also have some information about you know this especially the positive cases, that's only those that are known to us, only those that have been reported to us. There may be cases that students and or staff members have not let us know about, which we hope doesn't happen, but it's a reality. But we'll do our best to keep track of this as every day. When we get the numbers, we'll populate them. And we intend to have it a two week basis. So we'll have each day for two consecutive weeks. The following week, we'll take down the week of August 30th and tack on the next week so Morgan it says there um, close contacts and quarantine um, exposure with within school district and there's six per day um, so if those if those six people are 
calling in sick for the whole week. It's not necessarily 30 people. Right. It may be so the same six people. It's right? the same six people. Okay. The, for the active cases, we'll only tally those people one time so that there's no confusion over one case versus five cases like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there was one case at CLA that we reported on the 31st of August, for example, which resulted in six people who had to quarantine. The reason we're tallying it this way is so that we know who's absent more than anything. So we can see, okay, we, we might need six subs for these six people that day. The person who was COVID positive is listed also under the staff members absent due to illness. So that person was COVID positive and they're also absent because they have COVID or they could have something else. But that's more internally like, so we know, okay, that, that CLA, we have seven people who are absent that day. Because one of the, why that's so important is at some point, you know, every school district fears that you're not going to be able to staff all of your classrooms. You know, should there be a large number of people that have to be quarantined? Coupling that with a reduced sub pool here and everywhere. So we need to track that and we want the community to know that at some point that might be a factor in having to go remote for a week, a couple of days if we don't have enough subs. That's a reality of where we all are with COVID. So that's why it's, to Morgan's point, it's important internal information that we have to keep track of to make sure that we have enough subs to cover you know, our classrooms. So I think this is great. I'm really excited about it. I just want to ask Wenda, in terms of the 30, if, if there's a way you think we should note that, mm -hmm. so it just clear, so people understand to your point that that's not 30 individuals, that that's six individuals that have been out for five days. Right. You know, would that, do yeah, you think it, we should try to clarify that? Right, it, it just, you know, just so that um, when we're looking at trends, okay. that the trend doesn't look as if there's more people. Sure. So we'll, Noted. I don't know. We'll have to think that through. But the other thing is, um, just looking at it, if the staff member's absent due to illness, maybe specifying COVID or otherwise. Or a non-COVID illness, you're thinking? Co yeah, because I mean, right? Because it, it could be COVID, but it could also be non-COVID. Right. Because um, I can see that being like, wow, you know, if that number is high, like there's a, if it's a t bad flu season or something, there's a bunch mm -hmm. of people out for flu. People might think like. Wow, there's a lot of uh, COVID, you know, people out for COVID, even though, you know, I mean, some, some, something to specify on that might, might be helpful, I don't know. But so technically, if these staff members, if these teachers are out um, because they exhibit one symptom, are they still allowed to work from home because it, you know, it's just a runny nose, it's just a cough, or um, if they're not sick enough that they're, they need to be in bed? If you're well enough and you have a type of job that can be done from home, you can work from home after talking to your supervisor and it doesn't count against the sick day. If you have the type of job where you can't necessarily work from home or you're not well enough to work from home, then you would then you would take sick time. Okay. So this this will these metrics will be more important for quarantine, especially now because the twenty first is our date that we're starting to re enter students and where more people will be needed to be in person to be in front of kids. So if, if someone is told they have to quarantine beginning this week, Monday, that will impact our staffing for the return on the 21st. So anytime from here on out, we'll have that, that issue to, to think through too. Yep. And that's why, you know, I love the idea of our own dashboard. It's a one-stop shop, it helps us, but it also allows the community to see. Because sometimes they don't understand kind of all the factors. You know, when you read the IDPH guidance or guidance from Harvard or guidance from Northwestern now, you're monitoring several indicators um, that are county, but that are also internal, your staff. So we're hoping that this is going to help, you know, full transparency. This is kind of what we're dealing with. And sometimes we will have to make decisions that some people might not be in favor of or uh, might not understand. Hopefully this will, will help them um, mm -hmm. understand some of the difficult decisions that we're are likely going to have to make as we proceed with, you know, <coughs> COVID throughout the course of the year. And when this is all, when you can see this as a live document, I think you have a better understanding of the totals across the district because it does add up from every building at the very bottom what the absence level is for that day. So, um, sure. I have it scrolled down at the bottom. Oh, thank you. So, for example, today is September 9th. We, um, we have 
five people who are in quarantine due to close contact within the district. We have 14 people who are absent due to illness and 14 people who are absent due to close contact outside of the district or they have a family member with COVID symptoms. So that, that's not extraordinarily high, but we still have to balance that with how many, how many people would need a substitute, would we be able to do that? And um, I could ask Phil or Lisa to come up to talk to that part if, you're, if you need more information on that piece. This was really a joint effort between student services and my department and human, human resources too. Along. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Julie. This is a this was put together by Nutrition Services and Transportation, just to let you know that we continue to serve meals, and these are just some stats. Um, from March to August, uh, we operated under USDA uh, fund, the funded summer food service programs, and we're able to provide meals to children. And these are just some of our stats. But we served 387,716 meals which is pretty impressive. So this group has been nonstop and they will continue to be nonstop. Transportation and nutrition services, making sure that our students um, you know, have, have food each day. So we just wanted to share that because we're pretty excited. We did put that out in social media, but I just wanted to thank um, the members of the nutrition service department as well as transportation for making this happen. It's very, very exciting. And, and you know, much needed for so many of our families. Pardon? Did they eat all those carrots? I'm sure they did, Frank, and they wish they had more. No, because man. carrots are delicious. Maybe the apples and the oranges, but I don't know about the carrots. Um, <laughs> so I talked about e-learning. Um, we've talked a little bit about the metrics, so our dashboard. Um, we are looking at a couple different sources of, of, of data. We're looking at the Illinois Department of Public Health, something that was recently put out by uh, Governor Pritzker's office, the Adaptive Pause and Metrics. And most recently, one that is, is seeming to be probably the one that we're going to land on is from Northwestern. And we look at the Illinois COVID data um, by zip code. And they, too, like our dashboard, are looking at a two-week trend in positivity rates. And there's a number of factors that we are uh, monitoring by zip code. And the, of the seven municipalities in which we service all are part of, Six of them are in, in a, a good place in terms of under 5%. Many of them are around 3% positivity, so nowhere near that eight. So I have got a lot of green you know, ink. We do have one area um, as of the ninth, which is today, at the end of a 14-day rotation, that's at 5.9%. Um, uh, so that's, that's inched up into the yellow zone or an average of, let's see, positivity rate for, for, rolling, for a portion of Rolling Meadows is 6% on the 9th at the end of the seventh day total. So we're watching 60074, because that's the only one at this time that is in a yellow. So think of a traffic light, green, yellow, red. Um, the other, the other um, six are in a green zone. So we're watching those metrics. And why we're watching them is that's another factor. If we have a lot of community spread in an area, that may cause us to really have to think about whether or not we have to stay remote in certain areas. So that's kind of a messy, it's kind of, it's a little messy, but it is something that we're paying attention to because we don't want to, if there's a large community outbreak, have those kids come into school when we don't necessarily know um, the containment behaviors and protocols that families or community members are using. So it is just something that we're working with. District 211 and District 54, uh, as well as District 15, we're gonna try to be real tight on our metrics. We, st we continue to meet separately from the other uh, feeder superintendents, and we want to have a very similar approach um, when we do start to roll and re-enter that we use in terms of this is another indicator in which we're watching to make sure it's safe to, to bring kids into school. At, at what percentage does it go to red? Uh, it's 8%, but then this, from Northwestern, they look at uh, 100 cases for every 1,000. Weekly new cases, uh, the rate per 100,000. And we're looking at 100 new cases per 100,000, and we get a percentage, and then we look at the uh, rolling positivity rate. So this data is something new. I shared it with Morgan recently, um, and we're going to continue to watch it and kind of probably figure out how to build this into our dashboard so we can kind of show it all in one place and people can see what the metrics are. So what you saw 
Plus is a, a one-stop shop by zip code, I think is going to be, you know, where we're going to land. We're going to spend the ne next couple days analyzing this information and a few other sources that we've been reading and layer this piece in between now and before we start that rolling re-entry on the 21st. Speaking of the rolling re-entry, I did list for the board that on Monday, uh, September 21st, it is when we intend to bring kindergarten and uh, K-8 self-contained special education programs back. Um, and depending on the program, it's either gonna be an all, a half day or a, a full day program. Um, September 28th, it'll be grades one and two and self-contained early childhood. Uh, September, or October 5th, I'm sorry, grades three and four. October 13th, grades five through eight, and ECDEC, with blended early childhood. And that is when the junior high hybrid will begin. So that's just as a reminder, the rolling reentry plan. And we have our fingers and toes and everything crossed that you know, we're gonna be able to bring kids back. We, we can't wait. Um, one of the reasons we had to push that uh, date um, from Tuesday to a few weeks is uh, as we continue to get new guidance, it changes and oftentimes and it seems as they learn more about the spread of the virus and the virus in general, um, it seems to be getting tighter in terms of what the guidance is. So uh, one of the reasons we had to push back was a requirement that came pretty late to the game that we needed N95 um, masks, one, and then they needed to be fit tested, which is a whole nother process which requires individuals to go and have their masks fitted to their faces. But then they also need to make sure that they are fit, medically healthy, to wear such a restrictive mask. So that's, there's a number of steps there and you can't, as you imagine, just go and find an N95 easily right now. So we have um, received our N95s and we've started sending employees to have them fit tested. Um, so that process is in the works. We knew that was gonna be a big one and it is a mandate for, for people, uh, for our nurses and our protected health space supervisors if they're going to be evaluating anybody that's COVID positive or exposed, as well as for custodians that would be cleaning any COVID positive or classrooms with a potential exposure. So we, we are, are confident. I talked to Karen Flora, our district nurse today. That process is moving along, but I really did want to make sure that everybody knew that again, some of these, um, we, we call them like rings of fire. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they keep adding more rings just when we think we've got everything down that we need to really make sure that, you know, we've mitigated risk to the absolute, you know, greatest extent we possibly can. There's another layer and another layer. So we just continue to, to react and, and make sure that we can um, make good on all the guidance and, and make the, the school buildings as safe as humanly possible for staff and students. So, you know, fingers and toes, as I said, cross that Monday the 21st, we'll start to roll kids back into the school. Um, talked about metrics. Uh, hybrid planning is underway. The junior high principals, uh, Dr. Edgar, Dr. Kowalczyk and myself are meeting with the junior high. Um, they are working on their schedules. They have around 500 students um, that are going to be virtual and we are working uh, with the union, the junior high principals to see what that's gonna look like at the junior high. We have another meeting. We've had a couple this week. We'll have another one tomorrow um, and I'll continue to share uh, both in my Friday newsletters and to the larger community, you know, what our plans will be, but they're, they're moving along there. Um, Illinois COVID data we talked about right at school. So um, with having most of our teachers coming into school to teach, except if they had a, a you know, medical a reason in which they, they couldn't, um, most of those teachers had already asked to, to, to be virtual teachers and they were placed in virtual learning classrooms. Um, the vast majority of our teachers are teaching in school, so some of them needed childcare because their children may or may not you know, be, be more than likely are home if, they're, if their school districts um, are remote. So after many, many weeks, we were able to, um, and hopefully board will approve it tonight, work with a company called Right at School, and they will be able to deliver child care for staff members in District 15 and potentially um, other municipality, uh, municipal employees, so, because we needed a certain number of um, students to sign up for Right at School to make Right at School willing to come. So even though we're not necessarily in the daycare business, we certainly knew that, you know, that it was gonna be challenging to have teachers teach from their classrooms. I will tell you that I've received so many emails from parents to say um, how much the kids love seeing their teachers in their school and in their classroom and how it just feels more like school than it did. So a lot of positive um, you know, kudos from the parents and in walking through many of the schools, although it seems, it, it feels strange, the schools are very quiet 
and every now and again you hear a teacher on a Zoom for our Google Meets. Um, they've really created some great workspaces in the classrooms, so they have everything that they need, um, dashboards, Elmos, projectors, you name it, they've got everything and they're really kind of humming along. The teachers, really all of our employees have worked very hard to make remote learning um, feel and look much different than it did in the spring. And I'm very grateful for that because I feel like the kids are getting a, a much truer educational experience even though they're not in school. Um, talked about the numbers. The operational plan, we've been working very hard to put all the things that we've been talking about for the last six months into kind of a mini manual, if you will, that the buildings will make sure that they have, have kind of gone through themselves as building leaders and with their staffs to make sure that all the things that we've talked about, all the layers of safety that we've put in place, any changes in policies or protocols, we're, we're getting them all into, you know, into one document. So principles, it's out to the principals right now for feedback, for clarification, anything we've missed, anything we've talked about that's not here, anything that we might want to reconsider, and it, it's coming together. So I will share it with the board once it's in its final form, and uh, I have talked to uh, Scott Woolman and Ann Bridges, who are our CTC presidents, and we'll share it with them just so they're aware of all the hard work that's kind of gone into getting us ready to bring these kids back into school. Again, we hope starting on the 21st. And then lastly, um, I would say one of the other things that we've, we've, we've received emails on, you know, class size um, with face-to-face -face and virtual learning classrooms. And I know, Sam, you had asked that I make sure to talk about this because you're, you're probably getting emails as well as our other members of the board. So when we had our original instructional pathways, which were come to school in person, face-to-face, -face, or these virtual learning classrooms that we put in place, we knew that what we were doing by, offer virtu by offering virtual learning as an option, that we were creating our own type of hybrid, that we were going to be reducing the capacity of the number of students that were going to be live across our 20 schools. And as I shared a month or two ago, of our 12,000 students, we have roughly 8,000 that wanted to come back to school, and we had about 4,000, give or take, that wanted to be in virtual learning classrooms. So our goal in doing that again, reducing that capacity, was to limit enrollment, right? To have fewer kids in the classes so we really could distance them. And the guidance from the Illinois Department of Public Health was, you know, physically distance to the greatest extent possible, which we have tried to do. The World Health Organization says three feet. We've been, you know, we've been hearing for six months, six feet apart. The likelihood that most schools with, without reduction in capacity that could get to six feet was, was, was going to be tricky. The principals, the custodians have worked to set up the classrooms for the number of kids coming to face-to-face -to -face, so we really can't distance and in most cases we're five to six feet apart in those classrooms. That's, that's in person. Virtual learning classrooms, we looked at board targets and for some of our upper grades they're really not that far off. Fourth through eighth grade are between 26 and 28. And our, our virtual learning classrooms are probably between 26 and 30. Is that correct, Dr. Falchuk? She's in charge of those numbers. Where our numbers are higher in virtual, where, the, where we're feeling a difference, is with our elementary learners. Kindergarten is 20, it's a target. We have had kindergarten classes that have exceeded, we've had grade levels that have exceeded board targets. They're not, they're not hard and fast, it's a target. We have had more than 20 kindergartners in a room. First through third grade is, I think it's 20, 22 or 24. So we do have more students in our virtual learning classrooms. Um, one of the ways we're trying to provide support and increase or, or better the student to teacher ratio is by putting, using our ESPA, those are our, our parapros, our, our uh, program assistants, in those classrooms so they can, they can supervise, they can lead breakout groups, they can reteach something that's taught by a teacher and we're working to, uh, to, with the buildings, to go through shared decision making in order to be able to do that. Because there is a whole process through the CTC's collective bargaining agreement that requires that, th that that is a shared decision that the building staff get to make in terms of how they assign their general ed uh, PAs to general education programs. So we are working to make that happen and in many schools and in virtual classrooms it's already happening. But we're working with the union and, and, and um, you know, they're pushing that information out at the buildings and hopefully um, our, our staffs will, will see it as a, as a great way in which, one, to use our PAs during remote learning. Because, <laughs> you know, otherwise we're just trying to find work to keep them busy 
This is really important work that can help them provide additional support not only to teachers, but to students in those virtual learning classrooms. You'll hear um, when the budget presentation happens in a, in a short while that we've hired over 40 staff members to support those virtual learning classrooms. And that's where our numbers are. We, we allowed, because the state said we have to allow anybody that wants to go remote to go remote. Even though we had a deadline, many, many parents did not respond to any of our surveys, did not pick a lane, if you will. And many of these um, classes grew late into the summer and, and into the beginning of the school year because the parents did not actively engage with us to, to make a choice. So we had sectioned kids live that wanted to then go virtual. So we've worked as hard as we can to, to really um, to honor those requests, um, but, but that's where we are, unless we wanted to hire additional staff. We've already hired 42, I believe, mm -hmm. to, to, make this, uh, to make this all happen. So that is, I think, my report, my update and my COVID report. So any questions for me? One small question. Sure. You could, it could Sorry, be a big my question. Mic was on. Um, <laughs> so for Zoom, I know that previously yes. we had said that we wouldn't use it because of security issues and concerns. Has it has the platform just been updated from a security perspective that that's no longer a real concern? Absolutely. And okay. Janice, if you wouldn't mind coming up for a few minutes, I know you were on a big Zoom call. You talked with Zoom. If you wouldn't mind just coming to the mic, so because it is a very important question. Um, because we did not allow Zoom, and there were Zoom bombs and different things happening right. in the spring, you know, that everybody heard about. It was in the paper, um, and, and Janice has worked very hard with Zoom, um, so I, I just want to, I don't want to speak for her when she can. Yeah, we just actually had a, a two-hour call today with their engineers, mm -hmm. just going over how we can roll this out and ensure the safety of our students. And so we're going to be using something called authentication, which means that students will have to, they will not have Zoom accounts because being under 13, that's not um, a secure process. However, um, they will have to log in and be secure. So the only people that can enter our Zoom meeting would be a student with a D80 or a D15 account. So um, we hope to have this up and running next week. Again, it was it's a, a um, alternative to Meet um, because a lot of our teachers have gotten used to using Meet as well as our students. But we will be providing the professional development on that for teachers on the um, 18th. Does that help yeah. explain? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Good Thanks question. Thank you. And then with the, I know we've done a lot of training with teachers around use of technology and supporting them in that process. If we are engaging PAs more in that, will they be receiving professional development as well? Yes. Um, okay. Lori, Lori T. <laughs> she's our one of our new directors. Uh, she takes works with our non-certified staff. She and I met today. She's had several meetings with a few other people. One of the things that they're working to um, to do on the 19th when we have that e-learning day will be to train um, our PAs on how to use the tech. And then they're working, some of our schools have already started training our PAs that are also sub-certified in how to use that tech. So if we need to pull them to sub for a teacher, they know how to use all the platforms and all the different tech bells and whistles. So we, we do have a plan to make sure that not only our teachers, but our, our, our teachers' right hands, our, our program assistants, are trained as well. Awesome. Anything to add, HR? No? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes. All right, that's it. We're back in school. How was your break, my friend? So my name is Tammy Martin. I am a special education teacher here at TJ. I teach fifth and sixth grade LEAP. It's our instructional program, and I've been teaching for 20 years for District 15. When we preview our book, Down by the River, I noticed something in this picture. Jack, can you unmute your mic? Alessandra, can you unmute your mic? So setting those virtual expectations were huge for, for me personally. And once I had those in place and I've reviewed them each day with the students, it has just gone really well. And they just, they feel comfortable in the space because they're more relaxed, they know it's coming. And now I've started to slowly incorporate curriculum and actually teaching and I'm getting a lot of engagement from it. So, and don't get me wrong, I'm doing lots of things to try to get them engaged. Like I had my pom-poms out yesterday, you know, just trying to, you know, make it uh, fun because you know you can only do so much through the screens.
Up at the top, we are on the introduction. I know that because under section, it says introduction. I'm Mary Beth Landerman. I have been teaching at Thomas Jefferson for 27 years now, and I'm a sixth grade teacher. I know this is a little bit different, but since it's our first time, we're gonna do this first section together. Overall, it is incredibly exhausting, but it has also been wonderful to be back with the kids. That first day, after all the work and the planning to get there on the first day and start the meet, and when those faces popped up, it all came back. It, it really did, seeing their smiles, seeing them, being happy to see each other, it, it just took away all the stress and it was, here we are, this is what we do. This is what the first day of school is like. It's that excitement, it all, it all came back even though it was on, on the screen and not here in person. Okay, thank you for having a little meeting with me. I'll talk to you. You guys now go back to um, your silent reading, okay? I'm Kelly DeGrazzi, I teach fourth grade at Virginia Lake. We're doing a lot of hand motions, give me five, how are you feeling, and really working on building the community. That's the most important part, is just making sure that the kids feel comfortable. It's okay that we're all learning, just letting the kids know that I might not have every answer right away, but we're all just taking it one step at a time, one day at a time, and just knowing it's not going to be exactly how it was in the classroom, in person, but we're going to do it together. Down, up, down, up. My name is John Smart. I've been the physical education here, or teacher here at Virginia Lake for the last 19 years. All right, boys, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Well, right now I'm incorporating um, some different exercises this first week or two just to get the kids moving. Then I'll be incorporating some yoga, some meditation, and combining all that stuff throughout the school year as we go forward. Right in front, left in front. Keep going! We are working so hard and so tirelessly to make sure everybody is getting quality education at this point. So please continue to have faith in us because we are working really hard for your families. video on the uh, D15 Facebook page or YouTube or something it popped up uh -huh. on a uh, on a search just right in front of me it was great yeah, to, uh, great. Great great to great see video. it out there okay we are now working to have RSP who is going to do our next um, information report they're in I believe they're in Kansas City and they're unable to travel as a company so they had to kind of remote in here because we wanted to do this presentation in September. So give us just a few minutes and we're gonna we're gonna invite RSP in as well as Jen and Andrew from STR, our district architects, to give this presentation. Oh, here's STR. Somebody read out the uh, the meeting ID in case any of us want to uh, join up. Yeah, sure. Questions. I can hold on one second. I will find it. <laughs> well, that's Bless you. Could you just say, could you repeat the whole thing one more time? Eight seven five five three four six zero six eight eight. Okay, pass one. Capital X nine. Capital K six. Lowercase D as in dog. Uppercase Q as in key.
Yeah, if you would. Frank, nice job, you're in. Is anybody having trouble or are you all? We're just waiting for the presentation to be a little bit early and then we'll let RT um, Is this the a copy of the most recent presentation? Yes. Okay. All right, is everybody able to hear me? Yeah. All right, outstanding. I'm gonna hit um, the presentation mode so this gets large. Um, lots of stuff that we're gonna to cover tonight. Now, I'm sure when you saw there were 60 some slides, you thought we're gonna be here till 10 o'clock. Um, it won't be that long. I assure you of that unless there's lots of questions. The goal tonight is to give you an update where everything has progressed since the last time we met with the board. So there's a lot of information in here that I'm not gonna cover. It's really so you as a board or as the public comes back to this, we'll be able to see how things evolved. So the first couple of slides get into a little bit about RSP. I'm not gonna spend any time on that. We did all that the last time um, that we presented. Um, as I move through here, I did want to make again public the information that we used um, came from many different sources. And we added another layer with um, STR Partners, um, your architect firm, um, with information that they did. So we added that to this slide. Now, these first parts that I mentioned, I'm going to move through. Again, this is for reference. This was some perspective of what was happening with growth the projections, how it related to each building with the initial uh, capacities that were established for each of uh, those buildings. Um, we also um, have outlined here the initial task force concepts. So there's concept one, which has an elementary and middle school that we put together, what that feeder was. Same thing for concept two, elementary and middle school, tables, feeders, um, same thing with concept three, and then we get to concept four. So at the end of that last board meeting, um, there was some discussion about what you, the board, kind of liked. There was some follow-up that we had um, with, uh, I believe there were a couple committee members or task force members. Um, there were also um, some administrators, and there may even have been a board member or two. I can't, I can't recall with a couple of those meetings. So that brings us to part three, the concepts updated. So what I wanted to spend some time on, things that we learned from you at the last board meeting, what we heard from these different inputs that were either phone calls or Zoom meetings, were things that you wanted to see refined on these plans. So look at it as a bucket list. And what you're gonna hear from me tonight, it's a big bucket list 
Some of them are absolutely unachievable, and we'll talk about that on what those limitations are. Um, we'll also mention with STR, they provided some information that gave us an idea of how we potentially could maybe have additional educational space in some of these buildings, where as we looked at what was happening with growth and where we potentially need to position some of these students, um, they provided that information. They even gave cost estimates. We're not showing all the detail of what goes into those cost estimates or those specific projects. Um, I think uh, Jennifer or Andrew are also on this call. They can talk to that. Really, this was just to get us an understanding that if you try to do all these bucket list items, um, we could maybe achieve that with some building changes in combination, in concert with some of the realignment that would take place, but not all of it could occur. And we wanted to have some sort of benchmark with what that might mean for a project and of course a cost. So some of these things may get into that second bullet point of potential middle school building enhancements. Um, we also have the potential of the new elementary that would be up in that Northeast area, what we're referring to as the park place area. Um, we also had a lot of conversation about capacity and what capacity we would want to use, whether it was a middle school or an elementary building, to make sure we have the right space for the number of kids that would be in those buildings. And we had a goal of trying to get um, facilities, particularly at the elementary, where they would be under 90% utilization. Um, so that way we have enough space if there's bubble classes, so if it's a four section building and there's a fifth section that we might be able to, to adhere to that. We also had this, uh, the second bullet point, we had a lot of conversation about trying to have a complete feeder system. So obviously you're a K-8 district, but how does this coincide with the two high school districts and with one of the high school districts having two different high schools? So there's some challenges there, and I'm going to talk about that probably here in what we evolved in concept four. So those are kind of those big bucket uh, items um, that we had um, with the group as we moved forward in trying to get you some plans that maybe make a little more sense than what we were able to present at that last board meeting. So some of the specific drivers for um, concept four evolved was we still have Thomas Jefferson as an elementary school. We're still having full day kindergarten at each elementary school. We're removing the bilingual overlay. So every student's gonna go to the building where they're assigned based on what that elementary, or in this case, junior high um, boundary is. The grade configuration will remain as it is now. So K-6 for elementary, 7-8 for the junior highs. And in this particular instance, we're showing you something where it would be a complete feeder from elementary to junior high and high school. Going to be some problems with that though. We also open up the new elementary on the northeast side of the district, so that park place area. And we have Central Road attendance area where it's basically everything that's going to be west of 53 Highway. So if you're right next door to Central Road, you're not going to go to Central Road. Um, you're going to probably go to Wellbuilds um, or Kimball Hill, depending on how this boundary shakes out. We also had a cost estimate here of about $55 million. And when we get into the cost estimates, we'll let um, STR talk about that. We have a whole bunch of different notes down here of really kind of some caveats of how quickly can some of the projects actually take place to address uh, space need in this plan, um, as well as some, some things that we'll see in these following slides. So when we look at um, this particular scenario, um, you can see, hopefully my cursor shows up with my mouse. You can see the railroad broken here on this diagonal line. So you can see all of the elementary boundaries don't cross over the railroad. We come down here to the south side on 53. You can see with Kimball Hill and Willow Bend, we have them all east of 53, but even though Central Road is on the east side of 53, its attendance area is on the west side. Um, we pulled in the PDF on this, and I can zoom in in greater detail. These blue lines represented what were the past 
attendance area boundaries or the current ones that we have in place. Another thing that I wanted to highlight is with that new park place uh, boundary up here, we tried to create kind of an area around that development um, to make it seem like it's more walkable, although some of these roads, that's probably not always the case. That's kind of the visual of, of some of the changes that you see on this. For the junior highs, you can see again, it, it maintains um, keeping everything um, that's on the north side with 53 highway and the south side um, broken into um, those boundaries that coincide with the high schools. I want to shift a little bit with the data. So when you're on page 46 of this data, one thing that we've updated is we show you what that capacity percentage is for each of the years for the projection. And we're just saying with this new boundary, it goes into play. Here's how that relates with the capacity from 21-22 through 24-25. Looks pretty good with the elementaries, having the Park Place Elementary open up. That really was uh, needed to get those elementary buildings, if we're gonna keep that railroad as the breaking point, to have them under that 90% utilization. So without Park Place, you go back to the concepts that we presented at that last board meeting um, that we were at. Um, you can see we had some issues where we were concerned. Administration, I think you as the board were concerned. Are we really too tight um, up on that north side? We look at the junior highs. This is where this is just really quite honestly a disaster. Um, if we look at Plum Grove, if we try to do that east of 53, and I think some of the committee or, or task force members, they realized this, that we were going to significantly underutilize Carl Sandburg Junior High, um, if we're just saying everybody east of 53 goes there. Much like Plum Grove, if we say everybody that's west of 53 and south of the railroad, you go to Plum Grove, ridiculous amount of space is needed. And I believe in some of the notes that STR provided, probably 13 <coughs> classrooms, if I'm going off the top of my head, it would be really challenging to put that on that side. So probably not doable. So this gets into one of the comments that we left you with at that board meeting is what really is the efficiency factor that we want to see in this case, the junior high concept. We have quite a bit of space, but the buildings and our desire to have this complete feeder don't really help coincide with maximizing how we could utilize those junior high spaces. So that's probably the big thing that jumped out with concept four, trying to have this complete feeder. It doesn't work here and it wouldn't work in any other concepts um, just because there would be too few kids in Carl Sandburg, or too many kids in Palm Grove. So, and here's the feeder of that to, to show how that gets put together. So I'll move to concept five and when I get down with concept five and 5A, um, we'll open up for questions that you guys have. So concept five and 5A are very similar. The only difference is in 5A, we actually put in Park Place Elementary, um, whereas in five, um, we don't. Um, but basically we have Thomas Jefferson is repurposed as a middle school. We're still gonna have full day kindergarten at each elementary school. We remove the bilingual overlay. The grade configuration changes in 21-22 to K5, 6, 8. We're going to have a partial complete feeder. Um, and so this is, again, with the railroad, with District 211, we're able to, to maintain uh, that feeder uh, for them that they're, they're going to follow where they need to go. The Winston Campus Elementary would become part of the Winston Campus Middle School. So that entire site is a middle school. Central Road attendance area, again, is going to be west of 53 Highway. And then the preliminary costs that we have for the various projects um, that would take place in this uh, 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 concept is about $29 million, just a little bit shy of that. We look at the visual, you can see it's gonna be very similar to concept four, the difference being we don't have the Park Place Elementary on the north side. Um, you can see that again with um, Central Road, we're taking a area that's on the west side of 53. And you can see how that relates to like Kimball Hall and its little ends. 
with the junior high on five, we, we expanded so that we're using Sandberg more than what we were in concept four. This is where we have kind of that break, uh, a partial break where if you're south of the railroad, you um, may not go um, all to the same place going from middle school to high school. We look at the data. Um, again, we, we have some, some challenges um, with the buildings. Again, on this north side, particularly when we look at Lake Louise, I um, mean, 22, 23, we're over 100%. But you can see some of these buildings, whether it's Lake Louise or Lincoln, um, were much larger in the utilization than what we desired, whether it was the board or the group that was on the Zoom phone calls that we had uh, from that last board meeting. We look at the middle school, you can see things are a little bit better balanced. Um, we still have an issue at Carl Sandburg where we're just a little bit over 100%, so probably about two classrooms. I'm short of being under 100%, probably more like four classrooms to get it closer to that 95%. But you can see we could tweak some more things with the boundaries if we didn't want to have some of this complete um, elementary to middle school because we have available capacity in other places, um, particularly at this Winston campus. Um, some highlights with this Winston campus, this kind of started to take fruition in Concept 5 when we looked at the total number of students and what the capacity was with those buildings being junior highs, very efficient, inefficient buildings. So then as we looked at the desire as well academically, if we change this to 6 8, well, we need more middle school space than what is available with those buildings as junior high. So that's why TJ comes on as a middle school. We started looking at the number of students that were around the Winston campus, not a lot of elementary kids, um, a fairly uh, simple, but yet if STR was to speak, a little bit complex to convert that elementary into the middle school, but we can, we can use some different things with the sites and buildings that you have. So again, a little more work could be done if we get rid of a little bit of our desire on some of the bucket list items. So then when we go to 5A, um, we produce this because again, through those conversations on Zoom, it was, hey, is there a, another way where we still have this complete feeder, but we add the elementary on the north side to alleviate uh, those capacity pressures on the north side. So really everything, again, the same as Concept 5, but we just add in um, that elementary building there on the northeast side. Um, this preliminary cost um, is about $68 million. And this touches a lot of different buildings um, that create some different spaces, better spaces, um, science rooms, all sorts of different things when it comes to what's happening with these junior high buildings when they become middle schools along with that elementary that comes online. Um, so again, here's the visual of what we see here. Really what changed from 5 to 5A is on the north side where we were able to, again, create this boundary for park place area um, and then still populate the areas, uh, other elementary buildings like Jane Adams, like Louise, and so on. And here's where you see the, the junior high, or actually the middle school in this particular um, scenario. So we have two middle schools up on the north side, three on the south side. Again, we don't have a complete feeder as desired, but we get a little bit closer to some of the other components you asked for. So again, the table with the enrollment projections, and then the capacity as it relates um, to each of those years. Um, so pretty, pretty solid, all of them are under 95%. Um, Pleasant Hill, we, we could probably fiddle a little bit with there, but when you go back to the map, that's just a really tight area, so really challenging to get them lower than um, this by 24, 25, this 94%. Again, we look at this with the middle schools, um, Carl Sandberg's just a little bit over as we showed in um, Concept 5. So this is where I kind of put together something I think can help with some of our conversation. Um, and if I have to open up some other maps, I might just go into our whiteboard that we have in this conference room and, and we can kind of dig in a little bit. I think this kind of is a great narration of what we see with these three concepts. 
um, that can really open up some discussion that you have. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide and then let's move forward. So as we go into the dialogue that you, the board, may have, which may be questions or comments, I really want to focus on this fifth bullet point where it starts with evaluate the concepts. I think those questions that we put in there are, are really instrumental in determining which concept is going to be best, um, whether it's a, a cost component, um, but we really think, you know, is there support in the community for the grade configuration? Does it change from what you currently have? Are there some ideal sizes that you want the middle schools to be at? Because if one's super large and the others are smaller, um, there may be some different programming impacts that, that occur there. Um, we also know that uh, as we look at the capacity, that can change based on some of the programs. And so we've had some different conversations with the architects and administration about, you know, well, hey, if the Winston campus is all a middle school and let's say it's at about 75 80 percent utilization um, are there some positives where we can bring some other programs there um, that might be related to a central location and better access for students to get to that programming um, so th those really are the questions that as you think through each of these concepts really important to know and really leads to the last bullet point of Okay, we've done all this work, you've had this task force look at things, you've asked RSP to come in, hey, what's going to happen with our enrollment? We've provided a forecast, we got hit with this COVID, so trying to figure out, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, do we have things like what we're working with on the west side of Chicago? Do we have this great reshuffle occurring where we start to see a re-greening at a greater rate in your district? That's going to have an impact on students and capacity, but ultimately we think you're, you're probably going to need to have some sort of process to vet what these concepts are with the community um, to really know which way they may lean because they're so very different, you know, with the grade configuration or, or different components that you want to see take place in one of these concepts. So with that, I'll, I'll yield back to the board, um, superintendent as well, if there's some general thoughts, questions they want to provide for what I've presented to you this evening. Use your mic. It's actually something that we're hopeful for, but I'll have Renee talk about it. Yes, we are. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we are actually hoping that that would be able to happen um, with a, a new plan um, just because the bilingual overlay, when it initiated many, many, many years ago, um, it was actually, you know, it was well intended to prevent our schools from becoming segregated and for our populations to be um, mixed. And over the years, our populations have grown so substantially that now it's actually become quite a burden to continue to um, transport our students across the district. Last year, um, we did return some of our students who were being bused from Rolling Meadows all the way to Hoffman Estates at um, Thomas Jefferson back to their home schools, uh, closer to their homeschool area. Um, and it was very well received by our parents. So we'd like to continue to do that and have students attend school much closer to their homes. Is there a negative, Renee, to, uh, sorry, is there a negative to eliminating the uh, bilingual overlay? It's not necessarily a negative, but we would have to consider where students are assigned. So where they're currently assigned for their home school could put, pose a real potential issue for overpopulation at some of our schools. For example, Lake Louise would absorb an, an un, um, 
an unreasonable number of students. Um, it would not be possible for them to do that. So we'd have to look at the sections where the students live. And it's very possible, um, and just having done some preliminary work, that they also live very close to, say, Central Road or to Kimball Hill. And they could be reassigned very easily without disrupting um, very much for, for anyone. Right, because these kids are already going to a new school. So they're okay, most likely, with going to Central Road or Willow Bend. Right? So there are very viable options for us, I think. Yes, yes, definitely. Our numbers have grown by the thousands <laughs> since the overlay was implemented initially, and so that's no longer a concern for us. Can, um, is it, I, I can't make my audio noise, <laughs> so somebody else could ask the question. Um, I'm interested in Robert clarifying the uh, what the partial high school theater for concept five, the commentary that we couldn't make that happen. Here, um, you can speak directly into this. Thank you. The, uh, my, Robert, my question was, you, you referenced a, an inability to make the, uh, the high school feeder pattern work cleanly, cl cleanly within the concept five. Could you explain what is not, what you weren't able to fulfill there? Yeah, good, great question. And if I go back a couple slides. So when we look at the number of students, I'm gonna go to a map that's east of 53. One of the things that we looked at is with six, eight or seven, eight, there's an inefficient number of students that would be at Sandberg. And so we even looked at things, could you creatively um, have a different grade configuration? That would be the only way that you could get the right number of students and efficiently or effectively operate Sandberg there on the east side. So we even looked at, do you do like a K-4 and a 5-8? And then it was like, well, if you take too many kids out, if they make that a 5-8, okay, that works better for Sandberg. But then with the elementaries, it's do you need both of these elementaries? We're always like right on the cusp with the number of kids that are east of 53 and where facilities are located, even with Central Road, not taking kids on the east side, um, that there's just challenges. And then that throws things back where if you were to, to isolate there and you did a different grade configuration, does that change some of the way in which your delivery model um, is seen throughout the whole system. Does that matter if they all end up going to that high school? Those are some, some deeper questions, but it really just came down to the number of kids, the size of those buildings. Um, yes, we can make a boundary, and that's what we showed in, in concept four, but there's just not enough kids for the facility spaces or utilization to make that probably effective for the district. So what I think essentially when I look at this map, sorry, <laughs> thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think essentially when I look at this map, then we fix an issue we had potentially with kids from Hoffman that were going to Carl Sandburg and then coming back to Friend. So they were junior highing with children that they weren't going to go to high school with. And that was, that was something we felt was broken enough that it needed to be fixed. Now what it ends up happening is this pocket of west of 53 that goes to Carl Sandburg, they go to Fremd also. So all we've done is geographically moved the group of kids that don't align from junior high to high school. At least they're closer to the junior high. Yeah, because there's just, what he's saying is there's just no way you're going to get enough kids in this oh, I get it. Yeah, I get it. I, I understand okay. the why. I just, yeah, yeah. Right. the uh, you know, looking at it from a social-emotional standpoint with the children, that was, part of it was ge geographic. Part of it was social-emotional. Like in this, 
this, this pocket of um, right here, right along the train tracks that ends up going now to TJ for junior high. I mean, the, the time for driving on that is a minute difference than what was Hoffman to Rolling Meadows. So we, we, now we, we've just moved it. We've moved the problem is my, is my Yeah, point. well, I think the idea was to get them geographically closer. Is what mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to do as best as they can. Yeah, you yeah. just can't, there's just not enough kids to the east of 53 to fully utilize the capacity of Sandburg. You know, and the reason why you would have people to the east of 53 is because those are the kids going to Rolling Meadows High School. Right, right. But, you, but it just, there's not enough kids. Right? That's my yeah. understanding. Yes. Yep. Can, can I just, um, just for a moment, because I know people um, are watching this on Facebook or, you know, the community um, is entirely interested in this, but um, Robert, can you give us a um, cliff notes really quick of um, all these concepts so that, um, you know, I know we talked about concept four and five really in depth, but just of all of them and um, highlight um, in particular the things that uh, some of the community would really, um, w what they're looking for, full day kindergarten, and just, you know, briefly and um, so that we can all be on the same page, everyone that's... Um, not present within this room. Yeah, great point. So I'm going to go back a couple slides. Um, and the introduction to each of the concepts that we've uh, delivered to you this evening is really going to get into that. But let's start with four, because I do want everyone to be on the same page. Um, if we look at this um, introduction that we have, uh, Thomas Jefferson remains in elementary school, so if you're a proponent of, of TJ being in elementary school, you're going to like concept four. We're going to have full day kindergarten at each elementary building. Um, we're having all students go where they are supposed to go based on an attendance area, so we, we remove that bilingual overlay. If you like the grade configuration as you currently have it, um, this is the best concept. Um, if you're wanting to support alleviating some of the capacity on the north side, opening up the new northeast elementary in this park place area, um, a huge positive. Um, the central road attendance area, that could be a mixed bag because if you're right next to central road, um, you're not gonna be walking there, right? You're gonna be going to, to Will Bend. So um, a challenge there. Price tag for this um, is, is one of the higher price tags. Um, it's at about 55 million. So the difference then as we go from concept four to concept five, um, the big drivers is Jefferson is not going to be an elementary. It's going to be a middle school. We still have the full day kindergarten. We're removing the bilingual overlay. The grade configuration is going to change to a K-5, 6, 8. We have kind of a partial feeder, uh, complete feeder. Um, again, not quite where we want it. Um, Winston campus gets repurposed as um, the elementary becoming part of the middle school. So if you have an affinity for Winston elementary portion being an elementary, probably not going to like this. Again, Central Road, the same deal where the attendance area is west of 53. Um, the cost on this is about 29 million. This is one of the lower costs. But we don't fully address all of our utilization issues up on the north side. We go to 5A, um, again, the difference between 5 and 5A is we've addressed more of the utilization challenges on the north side of the district. Um, I also want to make it clear, too, so when we're looking at the, the railroad and trying to have these complete feeders, we also are limited. Let's say you said, let's not worry about the railroad as a breakpoint. We still would have challenges of getting all the elementary buildings under 95% with your existing inventory. It would be a, a near impossibility with having full day kindergarten. So what we took from those those last meetings was we really want full day kindergarten and we really want that overlay removed because we think we can handle um, the students throughout all of the buildings because of how that uh, need is, has grown in all of the attendance areas throughout the district. So we knew those two were, were huge takeaways and then we tried to get at that complete feeder, but unless you were wanting to do something different on the east side, I believe we could do a K-4, 5-8s. 
but I think we would be talking about um, do we need two elementary buildings down there? Could we do it with one elementary building? So a very different conversation. If the driver of having that complete feeder was needed, um, we could look at that. But uh, it comes with some other challenges. So that's kind of the overview. And then when we go to, I think, my last page before moving forward, I think I kind of address a lot of those components that I spoke about uh, for each of those. Um, concepts. And I also want to point out, just for the benefit of STR, is there on this, th these could change because there's there's so many different things. Like, does the park place, does it include land costs, um, the infrastructure changes, is it soft costs for putting things in the building? There's a lot of other things that still need to be vetted. So I, I do want to say that, you know, STR is done. Um, a great job of trying to get some estimates so that we have something to look at to know what this could be, but th these could change. Um, maybe better, maybe some a little bit worse as, as they dig into finalizing what that means. I have I have one comment only. It's really not a question. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, man. If I were sharper at this, I would have made it work. But, um, really, if I, at this point, I think I I I have a comment and going to a comment made at the other side of the table, and it's more for the community than for us because I think we are all clear on where we are in this process that we just started the process. Yes. This is the first time from when we um, hired um, the consultant. This is the first time that we're having a public conversation with regard to the responses. We've had some conversations with STR that have happened in public, but this is our first opportunity to look at all the options. Um, it is very much a starting point and going to what Robert was saying with regard to a community process. This is a community process. And this is basically our step one in beginning that engagement and, and making an effort to further define the wants and needs of the community more in depth than the original survey that Morgan had put out. And then try to figure out if we can come up with a solution that works not only to bring the best thing as far as education to our kids go, do the right thing by the communities, as well as ensure that we are being responsible with our taxpayers money and ensuring that any investment in the D15 educational system has some level of positive return for the community. Yeah, I would just yeah, add, I would just add <laughs> hold up. Multiple <laughs> ads there. I don't feel as bad as I felt a minute ago. Turn off? What am I supposed to turn on? Yeah, I can <laughs> A lot of adding. That's a lot to manage. Yeah, unmute that. Okay. Okay. Well, I just think that it's well, a I just good, think uh, that it's a good place uh, to uh, place to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, technology! This is what our teachers are experiencing. Technology, right? Okay. Um, can anyone hear me? Yeah. <laughs> can. Your camera. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? I'm only hearing you once, though. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. It was much more fun. Well, I mean, either way, just for again, this is more for the this is more for the community as well. I just think like um, from the the advantage of this is we are, now we have these concepts along with some more exact price tags that we didn't have before. Remember, before we had some concepts with kind of nebulous prices or. Um, disputes as to what what each one would cost, and I think this is a much more, a much better way to kind of um, restart the the discussion. And the one exciting, I mean, it's an exciting thing because I know that the, the the full day kindergarten thing at each elementary school, the bilingual overlay being removed as being things that are in all of these concepts is consistent from what I've heard not only since this board got together, but since the, the since the time I've been on the board, period. So, the fact that we have some options, multiple options that cover those two things, 
is a great starting point, and I, feel, I mean, we should certainly um, plan on, on what are the next steps to, to get community feedback on these options. Right, and I think that's a, a, a great segue, Zubair, thanks. So we wanted, and I absolutely echo everything that you've said, Lisa, I want to make sure everybody hears us loud and clear. No decisions have been made. If you're from Winston Campus Elementary, I don't want you to lose sleep. Like, these are concepts at this point, and we're at the very beginning. Morgan and I will have to fire up the town hall or community engagement machine to shop these ideas around, get feedback, invite RSP back at a later time. You know, this is going to be an ongoing uh, topic of discussion for this board for many, many months. Um, I noticed some of the dates in here said 21, 22. There's a 0% chance that any of this will happen. <laughs> a negative percent chance that any of this will happen in 21, 22. This would be 22, 23, you know, and beyond. It'll take this year and potentially next year if we had buckets of money. So we would have to figure out the whole financial piece as well as which concepts, you know, resonate the most with, with the board, the community, and whatnot. So we have many, many steps to go. So we wanted to get this to you, allow you to ask questions to Rob, bring it back next month, talk further about it, and then decide next steps at that point. Because I don't expect anybody to have any sense of where we should go for the October meeting until they have more time to synthesize this information, send questions to me, I can get them to Rob or to STR, and we can just continue to ask our questions as they come to us over the next month. We can put this back on the agenda for further conversation, a Q&A, whatnot, and then maybe at the October meeting, start to think about what that community engagement plan will look like to, again, shop these concepts around and elicit feedback from parents and community members, certainly the staff and whatnot. That's at least the plan that I have in my mind for the next few months. Does that seem reasonable to the board? Any? That sounds fun. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll put together some type of a, a, a doc in which everybody can put their questions in there, and then as the answers come through, you know, I can share them out via my party memo. We can share it with RSP and S STR so they can start um, answering some of the questions that we generate. We'll bring all of those questions and answers back to the October meeting. We'll continue the conversation, and then we'll figure out our timelines for engagement because that's really what I see the next couple of big, the months of, of work. We may have a committee of the whole where we talk about this, certainly some town halls in different parts of the community maybe each, each school, you know, we have a lot of decisions to make in terms of what we want that community engagement to look like. Yeah. But we know we need to do it well, and it's, it's going to take many, many um, months to do that. Yeah. I, I think it's also so worth saying, and I wanted to um, ask some questions about the, um, the earlier concepts prior to concept four, mm -hmm. and the concepts one, two, three, and four initially came from all the work that the Boundary Task Force did. So, you know, the folks from our community that volunteered their time and did all of the community engagement and the work on that task force gave a starting point for RSP to work through what they were doing and STR to work through what they've done. So they're building on the best of those concepts, and those concepts were pulled together based on feedback from the survey I mentioned earlier that Morgan had um, had out for the community, and we've got really good feedback in terms of what was most important to uh, the community, both community members who had children in school, as well as community members that have no children in District 15. Um, some of the most important points that came up in that were that community members wanted community schools. They did not any longer want children to be bused all over Palatine, which is what the bilingual overlay was doing for us. Um, they wanted to ensure that we aligned the feeder pattern mm -hmm. so that we didn't have kids that went to a school on one side of the tracks for elementary and then switched to the other side of the tracks for junior high and then switched to the other side of the tracks again for high school. And that was happening on both sides, and it was really a bad situation for children that are at a point that they're uncomfortable emotionally and socially 
and coming into new school two different times where they're not necessarily comfortable with their peers. So that was one of the other driving points. The, um, the, I, the idea of a community school or some anchor school in the Northeast that gave a location for so much of our school population that lived in that area, as well as fields and community space that could be utilized there. That was something else that came up. Am I missing something more? Yeah, just the feeder pattern, like you said, and then the continuity to high school. I think those were some of the top values, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. like oh, full day kindergarten. I totally forgot because I just assumed that was out there. <laughs> full day kindergarten was one, one of that was in the top five also. All right. If uh, anybody has any further commentary. Anybody? All right, Rob, thank you so much for zooming in tonight. And for all your work on this, are you still with us? Thank you, Rob. I am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Sam, are you ready for? Are we ready for a break? That would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My hips hurt. <laughs> I know. I remember last meeting she said if we could maybe take a break after an hour and a half or so. So five, ten minutes. What do you think? Five yeah. minutes. Five. Sure. minutes. Whatever. Okay. Five to ten minutes. minutes. Discussion regarding Park Place due diligence period extension. <clears throat> so as the board knows, um, twice now we have <laughs> gone to uh, Savas, the owner of the Park Place property and ask for an extension um, as we continue to determine whether or not we need a school up there in the Northeast Quad. So as you heard RSP say tonight, there are concepts that were shared that do have RSP, or Park Place rather, in the fold. So we wanted to know if the board um, would like us to extend that um, due diligence period again as we continue to work to kind of narrow in on concepts. It seems um, advantageous for us to do so administratively, but we wanted, you know, certainly the board to direct us whether or not to do so. And then Diana and Josh, feel free to come up and settle in while we're having a I, great discussion. I would think that the uh, extension makes sense at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. We will do the same thing with Mike that he's asked us the last few times. You know, we, we don't want to exp extend any money or or spend any funds to do so, um, and, and certainly if um, if something were to come up that he needed that space for another development, then you know we would we would proceed you know with him down that that pathway. But at this point, we think, um, especially now that we have concepts five and five A in play, that um, that would be wise. So we will reach out to to him tomorrow and uh, get the wheels in motion. But we sure. wanted uh, board authority to do so. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so the most exciting part of our, one of the most exciting parts of our <laughs> meeting tonight the most. will be the uh, FY21 the budget presentation. And uh, again, I'm Diana McCluskey. I'm the chief school business official for the district. And this is Josh Shute, my director of fiscal services, your director of fiscal services. And um, so we're going to present. Um, the final budget, and later in the meeting, you will hopefully adopt the budget. Next slide, yeah. So, my, I start out with the legal requirements. So there are legal requirements for the budget. They come out of this, this pamphlet called the Mechanics of School District Budget Guidance from ISBE. Again, the budget's a roadmap. It is a tentative outline. It's our best estimate of what is going to happen, hopefully, in the financial um, area of the district this year. We ha it has to be adopted by September 30th, and we've gone through all the steps ahead of time. We've placed the tentative budget on display for 30 days in July. You scheduled the public hearing back in June. We published the notice of the hearing in, in the Daily Herald on July 6th, and at the last board meeting, we conducted the hearing. School district budgets are based on fund accounting, which is a lot harder than regular accounting. Um, there are 10 funds in, this, in the um, district that are used. And they are, I, 
they are, we should refer to them as the operating funds and then, and, and then three other funds. The operating funds are, what are the funds that support the day-to-day -day operations. And Ed Fund is the largest. It is Fund 10. And in that fund mm -hmm. is um, uh, mostly the revenues are the levies, our local fees, like our food service, our student fees, um, the grants. And what's paid out of the Ed Fund is uh, primarily is the teacher salaries, admin salaries, the benefits, supplies, and everything needed to teach the children. Operation and maintenance fund number 20, that is um, also revenues like the levy primarily and some rent facility rentals, but we pay the custodians and the directors of uh, facilities, everything that ne that's needed to um, maintain our buildings and grounds, the supplies and everything comes out of that fund. Transportation is obvious, running the buses. Uh, fund 50 is IMRF, which is the, uh, the uh, pension for the non-certified employees, and Social Security has its own fund. Working cash here is a very small fund. We do not levy in that fund. Um, there's uh, very little money in there. It can be used for uh, a variety of reasons. And then toward is 80. We pay uh, our large insurance payments out of there, workman's comp unemployment insurance, property and casual, and we do levy there. And then the other three funds are, um, the debt service fund is of course where we, the bond proceeds and we make the payments of principal and interest through there. Capital projects is the district paid capital improvement construction projects and life safety. 90 is those um, improvements related to fire prevention, safety, and security. So now we'll jump into revenue assumptions. So these are big um, bullet points in the big picture of the revenue. I thought I would uh, identify the big ones that um, we looked at in, uh, in particular. So the levy, the 2019 levy, so the district again is subject to the PTEL. So um, the, on the non-tax -tax cap funds, our levy is up 3.17%, uh, which is good, it's high. The dollar value of that 3.17 is 4.6 million, and it's on a 1.9 CPI. So you know if you're subject to the PTEL, you can only increase your levy by the CPI or 5%, which is ever lower, and it's the December CPI. So we had to go with the 1.9% uh, CPI. The other major um, bullet points of the levy are the, is that it came in with a 47 million of new property growth. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it's primarily due to the roll off of the Dundee Road target TIF. Mm -hmm. So that was a boost to the district. Um, so in summary, the property tax revenue this year is budgeted about 129 million versus last year 124.3. So that's, that's a really good increase. The evidence-based funding is the state, large state money that all districts get in the state. They, their guidance was it will remain the same. So it's again budgeted at 16.9 as last year. Our federal grant money will increase about a million due to that CARES grant. Um, the CPPRT is, uh, it, it's a little lower than the budget last year, we, but we actually received 1.5. We're budgeting what the Illinois Department of Revenue told us at one million four hundred sixty two thousand interest income everybody is going to feel the effect of this because the federal funds rates at 0.25 a year ago is a 2.25 so we'll get maybe three hundred twenty eight thousand in interest income versus a hundred I mean 1.3 million last year I had to review the um, budget revenues sources of local which is the preschool tuition, special ed, food service, student fees, buildings, rental, transportation. They will be impacted by COVID at this point, is my best guess. Um, I had to reduce them about a million, and you can see that in Fund 10 and Fund 40 was affected. But leaving on a good note, the life safety bond sale last month was very positive. We raised 14.7 million at a 1.1 all in true cost, which was a lot lower than what was anticipated. So those are the big po bullet points. So here is the actual numbers uh, by fund. In the first column, I have last year's budget. 
Then in the next column is the unaudited actuals at this, when we did this prepared this uh, report. So, and then we have the budget this year, and the last column is the difference between the budget and what we actually received last year. So, um, we see in the operating funds, we hope to receive 4.4 million to the actual, compared to the actual. And the bottom is 14.4 million, and that really is the life safety, life safety proceeds. Next slide. And this is a simple pie chart that just shows you that the district, like many districts in Illinois, are heavily dependent on property taxes. They're 72% of our entire revenue. But that next um, in the red is other local at 10. You know, those are the fees that we do want, you know, this district still helps support the district in our to teaching our children. The tuition, the student fees, the food service, transportation, building rentals. Next state is at 12 and then federal is at six. So let's jump into the expenditure assumptions. So you've seen this type of a comparison before I know from Mike and Corey. So the teacher salaries are increasing about 2.7 million this year, around 71 million versus 68 million last year, approximately a 3.9% increase. We have 963 full-time equivalent teachers at, 70, at 71 million. Um, According to the, uh, you, the union contract, we would have been at 880 right now. So we took out the 83 FTE, the difference, uh, and costed that out to a, a cost of on the 880 would be about 67.8 million. Under the negotiations, um, uh, that would cost was predicted to be at a, around 68.6 million. So right now, um, that FT is coming in at under. We must, the district must have been able to hire uh, teachers at a, uh, you know, earlier or lower, um, you know. On the uh, salary schedule. On the lower on the salary schedule, right. So under projected by 840,000. Admin and non-union salaries increased by 2%. And it'll employee benefit insurance premiums, that, that really, uh, I think the district should be really proud of this. Uh, health is only going up 1.2%. It's a 6% average this year, and dental only 3.6, and it's the first increase since 2014-15. Those, those are they're really good cost containment. I've not seen that anywhere. Uh, continuing with the expenditure assumptions, we get the retirements. I think this is a pretty important metric. Last year in June, at this just past June, we had 53 retirements of T, uh, FTE, full-time equivalents. At 6.5 million was the retired salaries. They were replaced with 2.2 million of salaries. Uh, this year, at the end of this year, we're gonna have, uh, we anticipate 12.5 uh, FTE, and they're retiring at 1.7. And again, in the expenditures overall, we've had some, we have some curriculum adoptions included, junior high level, math, social studies, and TCI, and then some technology upgrades are also in the, in the numbers. Um, in Fund 60, we'll have, we are budgeted 10 million for the, the, these various um, building improvements, as you can see listed. And then in Fund 90, which some of the proceeds our earmark this year from the bond sale, boiler, and HVAC uh, updates. So now I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Um, so as you can see and as you've learned by just being a member of the board, COVID-19 is, COVID is costly. It's not cheap to make sure that the kids have what they need to learn and also that there's staff that allows us to provide the virtual learning environment that's necessary in this current current time. So there's four main um, there's four main additional types of expenditures that were added because of COVID-19. We added 40 full-time equivalent teachers, and they're staffing mostly the the virtual classrooms. That came in two and a half million for salaries and benefits. Additionally, to comply with federal, state, county health guidelines, we needed to hire 10 additional 
sub custodians to do the cleaning and the sanitizing. Um, also, just because of the digital environment, you need certain licenses, softwares, Chromebooks, cases, hotspots to allow people that need to get on the internet and have the computer to do the work and do the Zoom meetings and Google Meets to have what they need. So part, part of those costs were offset by the CARES Act grant that Diana mentioned earlier, but as you can see, that was just a, a small dent in the overall cost. So we got 1.6 million. The cost of the items on that slide, it's about 4.1 million. So on the next slide, it's broken down Back one Let's slide. Go back to the pie chart. Pie chart. Uh, yeah. That's a graphic representation of the previous slide. So as you can see, the largest cost is salaries and benefits for additional staff, which you would ex expect to see for a school district where most of the cost is salaries and benefits or a service organization. So people, people costs are the bulk. Uh, next slide. Um, Essentially, if COVID-19 did not hit, we would not, we would basically be breaking even or have a slight built-in deficit, which is just being used to fund capital projects and maintenance projects at the various schools. Um, because of COVID, we are expecting to see higher expenditures by about $4 million, $5 million. And that is mostly in the education fund on the top line. You'll see it's 4.6 above the unaudited actuals. And as Diana was pointing out in the revenue, there's also, we're comparing the unaudited actuals. The, the auditors are on site right now. They'll be presenting to the board the audited information in November, December, once everything's finalized. We don't expect a lot of changes, but there will be some because we're waiting for the final information to come in that goes into the audit. Uh, next slide. So again, we're a service organization, so the, the bulk of the district's budgeted and actual expenditures are salaries and benefits. 71% of all of our expenditures go to pay and benefits. Um, on this slide, this includes transfers to fund capital projects. So we're going to actually go to the next slide that's more of a picture of what the actual expenditures are. Um, we're expecting lower revenues because the school buildings are closed, so we won't, ex we won't be collecting the fees that Diana mentioned to the extent that we would should the schools be open for the entire year. Also, as shown on the other slides, because of the, the extra cost, we're going to expect expenditures to be higher. So overall, in the main fund that's used to educate the kids, we are showing a deficit of $5, five million, primarily made up of COVID-19 costs. Um, yeah, we can, let's see, we can talk a little bit. So yeah, in the operating fund, so this slide versus the previous one. The previous one shows the transfers. So I think mm -hmm. if we can go back to the previous one, um, we've got 2.5 million coming out of Ed Fund. It's mm -hmm. going into O&M, right? Correct. And then I think 6.5 million coming out of O&M going to capital projects, right? So the, so the significance difference here on the operating funds, the deficit of 8.8 .8 million is because there's 6.5 million going to below that line. It's transfers, um, which have been previously approved by the board and, and uh, included in the tentative budget. So the bottom line is still, is just, is all funds deficit 2.5. That doesn't change. If you go to the next slide again, please. Yeah. With, so with the tra without the transfers again in the operating funds, um, deficit of about 2.3 million. Right. So the deficit on either slide is the same. It's just moving money to cover capital projects. So the way that I would think about it is when you get paid, your direct deposit goes into your checking account. And if you have a savings account that you use to fund 
special projects because your your paycheck doesn't go into the savings account you need to move it over there to cover anything that you pay out of a savings account so it's moving from ed fund that has a that has a paycheck down to capital projects that doesn't so that's that's the significance and a, a general real world explanation of what a transfer is mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we wanted to mention because this is a unique year and there is a deficit which is unusual we are going to be tracking the information on a regular basis to just compare it to what happened in a last year and what we would expect for this year and then we will be updating the board and Dr. Hines and everybody on a regular basis just so that we know that if there's anything that we really really need to address on the front end that that's being done uh, next slide okay this slide all right so if you take everything together as we we believe it would be now if everything happened perfectly which it never does mm -hmm. we would end up with these numbers on the third column so the first column again to go back to the the savings account example that first column is the district savings account at the at the beginning of the year this year which we're projecting it will change a little bit after the audit but probably pretty close right should be pretty close then the, the numbers from the previous slides, the pluses or minuses, and then the ending savings account balance. So this year, being an unusual year, there's a bigger than normal drop. It's should everything happen just this way, we would end up with 22% fund balance in the operating funds. Um, basically what that means is you have 25% of the entire year's expense in the savings account for the next year at the end of the year. So what you are going to pay in FY22, it, you could pay two months worth of payroll, two months worth of AP, while you're waiting for the property taxes to come in. So that's a normal, it's normal to have around 25-ish percent in your savings, your savings account at the end of the year. So we're hopeful that things will start getting back to normal at some point, but at this point we don't really know, so this is our best guess. And should everything happen just this way, that's how the end of the year balances would end up. And pass so, yeah. it back to Diana. Thanks. So there are notables. We want to bring those to everybody's attention. So. The fund balance is used for, is one reason, thank goodness, the district has a healthy fund balance. Some districts are in more dire shape, or in very dire shape. This is not dire shape. So there you, it's used for unforeseen situations, rainy day, this is it, COVID is it. Um, second bullet point, the 53 FTE teacher retirements, that certainly helped offset the budgetary impact of hiring 40 additional FT uh, teachers. Again, over, over many years, that self-funded health insurance has, has contributed to that fund balance considerably, I'm sure. Um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that there could be some possible additional federal assistance. And at some point, we will um, apply to FEMA for reimbursement of some of our COVID expenditures. Uh, there is a budget of 1.5 in the substitute budget. Um, we hopefully, you know, that may not be, uh, there may be some savings there because of this virtual teaching and the way things are going right now. We got two new grants in worth 25,000. We're developing virtual learning in the district. And from that video we heard earlier, um, it's very, very encouraging and, and definitely a wave of the future. You know, I know snow days may be a thing of the past. Um, and again, the life safety bond at a 1.1 all in true cost, it was projected at 2.8. Um, again, CTC salary growth was under, is under by about 840,000. 
And it sounds like I've not been here long, but these long-awaited facility and life safety improvements, improvements are underway. And what just came out um, last week was that the USDA, they extended the summer reimbursement. So on that one slide you saw about the, from the food um, service, um, the summer seamless option, that's a higher reimbursement for breakfast and lunch. They've extended it through the end of December. So we're going to see uh, some additional money in the food service reimbursement. So that, that's great. It, there'll be there'll be some extra money coming in there. So that's our presentation. And do you have questions? In the packet, I mean, feel free to, I just want to know, also in the packet is the state forms, which are, you know, a lot of detail. Feel free to <laughs> reach out to us, you know, if you want after the meeting. If you have trouble sleeping at night, <laughs> you know, these state just forms. Case. Yeah, they, I don't, I don't have, have any questions, but I do want to say thank you for pulling together the COVID costs. Yes. Because we, it is something that we have talked about for months at this point, but I don't think any of us had a really good feel for what the, the total cost and the continuing costs are of COVID. And right now is certainly a time that we're fortunate to be in pretty good financial shape because if we were not, we'd be having quite different conversations. Yes, mm -hmm. I have one question about the COVID cost. So this would be for the whole year if it continues or is this only for the first semester? No, no. That's, for, that's for the whole year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if barring anything unforeseen, like if we were to need additional, I don't know, computers or whatnot, we would bring those expenditures to the board. But this is what we really think it's going to cost us at this moment in time for the so, entire year. Okay. So theoretically, if this were to stop after the first semester, then these expenditures could be decreased. Well, to a um, certain extent. Yeah. Right. Uh, not I, the staffing. But. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Some of the sub custodians, we, might, we would not hopefully <laughs> need them as much. Um, but right, most of this is purchases due to uh, virtual learning and the accommodating the 40 FTE teachers and, you know, hotspots and things for the students for some right. homes. But the 40, now you're saying the 40 additional teachers, even if, let's say, it stops at the end of the first semester, those teachers would still be kept on for the full year? Well, they're under contract with us, okay. so we would, you know, they have, a, they have a contract. We would have to... I can't imagine we would do any rift or anything of somebody that has a contract. I mean, they're under a year-long contract. There's so. also a stability aspect to it. That so what, it, what we would do with work. those teachers, because we have thought about this, if, if, if you know we were to suddenly have a vaccine and we were able to go back to business as usual, you know, we already have plans to use the teachers as interventionists, additional reading intervention. We could deliver math intervention. Um, the tech department instructional technology would love a million more sets of hands so we have plenty of places that we could repurpose the teachers if they were you know properly licensed to do so so we would find ways to you know use them but they wouldn't necessarily be teaching in a virtual learning classroom if we were able to all come back to school for any length of time or for the remainder of the year so can I piggyback on that um, question as um, you had uh, emphasized that we had a really good fund balance um, to help us out through this year and um, ensure that, you know, that we're, we're still okay. But if um, things were to go south and, you know, um, you know, I, I asked uh, Micah Damstrick this uh, last time too, if we had to do this another year and, um, you know, property taxes were, you know, dropping and, um, or there's property tax freeze and all that. Um, how much longer could we weather at the rate that we're going? I mean, basically, this should be a one-year thing. There's there's not enough money in the whole world to have year after year of this kind of deficit. Like, you have two and a half months with the fund balance that Mike and Corey had worked, and the board had worked really hard to build up. It's really easy to spend it down. It's really hard to build it back up because a district is constrained by different rules and regulations about how much money it can bring in. So I would say that the uh, you, you could only really sustain it for one year. Otherwise, you'd have to start looking at the way that the district 
operates structurally? Programs and services, class sizes, hiring practices, curricular adoptions, anything, any professional development, there would be a lot of, of things that we would have to examine. Starting the farthest away from the kids and then moving our way in so we could still deliver on you know what the community has grown to expect of District 15 and the education here to look like. But we would be having a lot of very hard conversations should we have to do this you know, to Josh and Diana's point for, for more than this year. And then one other thing that you want to keep in mind is no matter what, built into the budget on a regular basis, you want to make sure that you have the ability to maintain the buildings. So deferring maintenance is not a way to continually plug a budget gap. You have to keep the buildings up because you're either going to pay now or you're going to pay later. So that is something that no matter what has to be uh, part of the budget presentation and conversation so that the buildings are maintained at the level that they need to be at. We agree with that very much. <laughs> so this board agrees with it. It's one of the answers that got him his job. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> that philosophy. Um, I, I, I will reiterate a um, comment that Josh made. Um, I think it's really important that we start really, um, you know, the monthly financial reports. We have to look at them very carefully. I do do a cash flow analysis. I don't recall if there's one in this board packet, but I do, I'm building one right now. I use that as a, and I compare it to the previous year. So we, with the, uh, um, the October 1st um, extension, you know, for p property tax payments, I've been watching that. We are lower than last year for the first two months, I'm hoping that that will be, will come in in the next month. So. But you did talk, we talked about they had, extended when you could pay your property right. taxes. So we're that hoping that that's the reason that we're, there, we're, we're lagging right now in, in property tax collection. It was, ex yeah, it was extended to October 1st. So at that point, once that deadline hits, we'll have more information right. year over year. Yeah. And then would you report that next month in your yeah, board we can. so they know where we are, mm -hmm. you know, once the deadline has passed? Mm -hmm. Um, right, yeah, by then we'll, for right, by the next board. Property tax mm -hmm. collection yeah. and payment. Yeah, I think that's really very important to keep an eye on. So, any other questions? There is a signature page for the board. Right, we do have a signature approved. page here. If the, board, if the budget got, is approved. We've got it. We've got, we've got, got it. it. Good. Thank you. Want to make okay. sure we, we've forgotten that in the past. And yep. The, it's sitting right between Craig and I here already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, thank, thank you both. Just uh, really and truly thank you both. Uh, when you're new in a district and, and these two roles, and you have a mere few months to get your head around a very large and complex budget, especially in a district of our size, to be able to have a budget, a, tentative budget you know pre presentation to the board and then just another month later to pull all this information together they worked extraordinarily hard they worked extremely well together you know two great new members to the team thank you thank you, thank you, so, thank much. you so much i have to also recognize Dan danielle oh, gardino yes. she's been great she well, uh i hope she's listening <laughs> Thank God she, you know, has was one of the, somebody who had been here already, all right. and uh, was really helping us guide uh, us all through this. And she did a lot of number crunching, so I want to recognize Danielle too and thank her. And we all got Danielle, to see Mike Adamchek so. last week. He came back. To yeah, we did have Mike come in. I had him come in. You know, he came in we, for a couple hours. We spent hours. about a half a day <laughs> going back and forth, so, coming through the numbers. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. All right. So thank you both. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, reading and acceptance of minutes. May I have a motion, please? Can you speak a little louder? We'll have a regular board of education meeting. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> um, great. Um, everybody just check to make sure that your mics are on. I know I had turned mine off before, so. Mm -hmm. Could be, uh, yeah. All right, um, board committee reports, Frank, Edward. 
Um, there's nothing really to report on. The state legislature has not been meeting for quite a while, so uh, there's nothing new news there. Okay. Yeah, kind yeah. of boring. One time foundation, Mike? Uh, yeah, briefly. So um, fundraisers are in the works for this coming year. Obviously, with COVID, it's a little bit more difficult to decide, but i um, happy to report that the 50-50 raffle that has been a success over the last couple of years will be coming back this year, so be on the lookout for that. Um, the flexible seating options have been kind of sort of almost installed at Gray Sand. We're almost done there as well, so looking forward to getting the kids in there and for them having to see it. So uh, just keeping in mind that, you know, with COVID that, could be hearing stuff and could be rolling it out really shortly as soon as you hear from hear about it. So, um, but yes, things are in the works. Yep. Great. Finance committee, Anthony, window. Yeah, so finance committee, August 31st, uh, the wind was taken out of our sails because that was the majority of our conversation, but <laughs> I will uh, I will second Lori's comment in regards to uh, Diane and Josh. It was great to, to meet with them. Um, again, they came well prepared. Um, had all the information, the data, you know, one to nine through questions at them, and, and they were ready to go. And so it was, it was really nice to see that. Um, but again, we spoke mostly on the budget and obviously the impact that uh, COVID is having on the district and what we can do moving forward. So it's good mm -hmm. conversation. And then I also had a follow up meeting with Frank, and I think Diana talked to Lisa too. So mm -hmm. they're also making themselves available. So should you have any questions? You know, feel free to email, uh, copy me on the email so I'm in the loop, and they're, they're always very amenable, you know, should the board have any questions in between me. Uh, equity committee, Zubair Sam? The equity committee uh, met uh, last week, and just the last couple of meetings we've had, um, there. first of all, I'd just like to say that there's a, there's a lot of interest in, in, in the equity committee. <laughs> Uh, there's pe there's a lot of people within the administration, teachers, that are very passionate about the issues that that uh, we brought up. Um, what we're doing moving forward is is we've kind of um, we've seen a, a, in this board and previous boards a, a kind of an emphasis on the opportunity gaps, kind of been the number one thing we've kind of talked about, and that's still obviously very important. But we've kind of ch decided that we should be changing the focus of how we look at equity and not just limiting it to the idea of academic achievement, opportunity gaps, and just really making sure and evaluating that the, um, the rest of the many areas within the district are, you know, the value of, equ of equity is kind of permeating through everything that the district does. So it's kind of a different orientation altogether. And what we're going to be doing in the short term is you know, kind of defining what equity means in, in District 15. It's kind of like a, a, a definition statement. And then kind of um, part of that is just evaluating what's already being done because there are a lot of things that are already being done that affect equity, some of that being the social studies curriculum review that we were part of, uh, SEL review, some of the things that we had talked about, the gifted program being reevaluated. So some of these things are already being done. So we're, the committee is going to you know, understand and evaluate our current uh, programs and initiatives and then kind of uh, determine... Um, how we should be looking at different aspects of the district uh, through the equi equity lens, all, all on top of what we've already done in terms of the looking at the opportunity gaps and achievement gaps that was presented here, I think, a few months ago or more than a few months ago, and that'll be done on a year-to-year -year basis as well. So, um, you know, so that's kind of uh, what we see moving forward. Um, as far as next steps... Um, um, so we did have... Oh, we're looking for it right now, so... Okay. <laughs> Morgan and I are both like, I know Laura Swanlon sent it to me, and so I apologize. We're, we're trying to find it both. No, that's right okay. <laughs> yeah, one, um, that's one, okay. One, one of the... Um, why don't you talk about the, the, yeah. the slide that you had brought in? So um, board members have it at their table, and it's also on the board packet online um, that's available for the community, but... Um, I did pull one sample approach to understanding how we can assess equity across a school district and not just focused on the achievement gap and the opportunity gaps that exist. And so I just wanted to highlight a few samples in here. There's a bunch of different categories, but for example, when thinking about school funding, we can ask ourselves the question of does each student attend a, uh, a school in a district that distributes funding based on the needs of its students? 
does funding support all children to achieve and thrive? Um, another example is teaching quality and teaching diversity, which is something that's become increasingly important um, to members of our community as well um, as our staff and um, the board. Does each student have access to strong teachers and teaching practices that meet their needs? Do the teachers reflect the diversity of the student population? So this is definitely an area of growth for our district. Um, so these are just a couple examples of ways that we can broaden our scope of how we think about equity in District 15. And part of our work as a committee will be figuring out what is the right sort of structure and um, categories that we see as important um, to discuss equity and how we are um, being successful in our equity work as it is a core value of our organization. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, Zubair and I are meeting as the board reps of the equity committee to start to outline our board priorities and direction. Um, and then we are also meeting with Dr. Hines to align on sort of a larger process um, and key outcomes for this year. Um, why focusing on this year is we will be starting a broader strategic planning process um, in the coming year, and this will certainly be foundational to that work, so we don't want to pre-do our strategic planning, um, but hopefully have some of the information and some of the goals that we set for this year help to inform that work moving forward. Um, and then we'll also have our full equity committee meeting um, again next month. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? All right. Thanks again. Action items. Um, item 9.1, may I have a motion, please? Make a motion to approve the September 9, 2020 personnel report as presented. Second. Se second. Roll call. Hunt? Aye. Han? Aye. Smolka? Aye. Shukai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Ader? Aye. Anna Reno? Aye. Motion carries. We got the discussion on that one. Sorry about that. Um, item 9.2, motion please. I make a motion to approve the administrator and teacher salary benefits report as presented. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Roll call. Khan? Aye. Smolka? Aye. Shupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Ader? Aye. Anarino? Aye. Khan? Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.3, please. I make a motion to approve the FY20. 21 budget as presented. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Smoka? Aye. Shupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Ader? Aye. Anarino? Aye. Hunt? Aye. Khan? Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.4. <laughs> May we have a motion to extend the uh, due diligence period, please? Make a motion to enter into an amendment to the real estate purchase agreement for the Park Place property dated June 25th, 2019 to extend the due diligence period for at least an additional 120 days, subject to the review and approval of the board's legal counsel and authorize the superintendent or board president to sign such amendment. Second. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Shukai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Ader? Aye. Anarino? Aye. Hunt? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smoke? Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.5, motion please. I make a motion to approve the right at school LLC before and after school care program as presented. Second. Discussion? Yeah, I have a quick question. Right? Have, you, have you gotten sufficient interest that uh, you anticipate that, that this will be involved. We have. Um, a number of our staff, yes. Um, and then we have, we put it out to some other local Palatine municipalities and we're, we're starting to receive some interest. Correct, Morgan? We can about 15 teachers at this time. No, it's a little bit less right now. Uh, some teachers have indicated a need for care in the coming weeks. So they
it, what's the threshold we need for it to be uh, viable? Okay. Oh, okay. It's not a budget impact, per se. No, no. not to us. <clears throat> More of just a service because we were having staff work from school. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Roll call. Wong? Aye. Ader? Aye. Anna Reno? Aye. Hunt? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smolta? Aye. Shupak? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, motion for 9.6, please. Make a motion to approve the Nisella History Module purchase junior high curriculum support in the amount of $32,340 as presented. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Ader? Aye. Anna Reno? Aye. Hunt? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smoka? Aye. Shukai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.7. Motion, please. Make a motion to award the contract for the purchase of 4,537 OWE on Chromebook cases to Hutt Global DBA volume cases in Boca Raton, Florida for a total bid award of $72,365.15 as presented. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Anarino? Aye. Hunt? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smolta? Aye. Chupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Aiden? Aye. Motion carries. Would anyone like to remove anything from the consent calendar? May I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. Second? Second. Roll call. Hunt? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smoka? Aye. Chupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Ader? Aye. And Reno? Aye. Motion carries. Dr. Himes, correspondence? Uh, as you can see in your packet, we received a number of Freedom of Information Acts um, since the last Board of Education mm -hmm. meeting. Min Goodwin serves as our um, FOIA officer and has worked closely with Steve Richter from Hodges and Louise to respond to these FOIAs. Any questions? All right, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.